Last Lord's Day, we discussed the subtlety in false prophets who come to us, who come in our midst, come in our meetings with sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. The teaching, of course, is part of a series of warnings provided by our Lord for his hearers to execute and exercise judgment in making a personal choice after hearing all of the principles spoken of in Matthew 5 through 7. Remember that the entire Sermon on the Mount is far beyond just us hearing the good points and principles of our Lord, but it is intended for us to apply, to make a choice. And all of these warnings really find itself built upon the statements given to us in verse 13 and 14, the crossroads, the uh, call and the exhortation to choose the right gate, the narrow gate, and the narrow way. Of course, this is with the understanding that there is that broad gate that all sinners are born into and are currently walking in up until the point that the Lord saves them from it or not, they will continue to walk that road until damnation. If truly we are a people who have received his words, then this, these four warnings reveal to us that we must enter into the right way, that we must bear the right fruit, that we must do the will of the Father, and that we must obey his words as a wise man who built his house upon a solid rock. And as he exhorts us to make a choice, we must beware of listening to what we call false prophets that he so greatly speaks of in verse 15 when he says, beware of false prophets. We've already started this teaching last Lord's Day. And we learn that he wants us to beware of these people who stand at the, at the broad gate, who post themselves there and lure and woo men in that direction. Because their lies will persuade you to never believe in the sound words of Christ, their, world, their words of lies will teach you uh, astray and lead you astray from the narrow gate. And I think we must be reminded, and I do not desire to give you a full overview of everything we talked about last uh, Lord's Day, but I think Matthew 23 is enough to give us all the points of what we've discussed. Let us be reminded that the Lord Jesus Christ has the scribes and Pharisees in mind throughout the entire sermon, especially in this part. Because in Matthew 23, he comes again to talk about these scribes and Pharisees, and he describes them as the false prophets. He describes them to be full of pride and hungry for power as they sit on Moses' seat. He describes them to be preachers without practice, men who do, who do deeds to be seen by others, men who love the honor and compliments that come their way. They are men who shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for they know that they themselves will not enter in, and so they lure men with them to the narrow, sorry, to the broad way. And so they shut the doors in people's faces. He further describes them to be men who make children of hell or disciples of hell. Worse than them, twice as worse, the Lord Jesus says. He describes them as men who neglect the weightier matters of the law, who do not preach the sound gospel, who do not declare the full counsel of God. They teach good works and burdens and tie yokes upon men that they could not bear. Most of all, they are externally clean. They are people who wash themselves outwardly, but inwardly are full of greed, full of self-indulgence, dead bones and uncleanness. You see, the words of our Lord continue to prove themselves true today, as we see the speedy multiplication of false prophets in all of the world. We see this in the outright heretical statements and teachers who stand before the pulpits and the statements they make in our age. And aside from the outrageous heretical teachings, there are those men who speak with flattering words, who speak some truth and omit many truths. We recognize that the false prophet is not, the, is not just the one who denies Christ, outwardly and, and verbally from obvious statements, but the false prophet is the one who does not speak the whole counsel of God. And so if there are many false prophets in the world, then there are many false converts in the world and many false Christians in the world, disciples who follow the same pattern of those false teachers. And so clearly our Lord was concerned to emphasize this matter that he gave us great wisdom in his sermon. 
wisdom to detect the falsity of the works of false teachers and false converts. He said, you will recognize them by their fruits. And he elaborates this further. I guess we could have really studied this as a whole, but because of uh, the amount of things that I'd like to say about it, we had to break them in two. Last week, we learned that there are two schools of opinion. The first being that this is just referring to a man's teaching, and the second that it refers to his lifestyle. We've established that it has to be both because you cannot separate one from the other. And as we continue the very account, we'll notice in Matthew 7, 16 to 20 and Luke 43, oh sorry, Luke 6, 43 to 45, that the Lord Jesus is further elaborating how one can recognize the fruit of the false prophet. What's interesting is that Matthew and Luke are obviously using similar sources. It's not proven that they use the exact same source, but they have similar sources that they're writing their gospel accounts uh, from. And what's interesting is that they differ in their use of it slightly. Matthew makes the direct and explicit, con uh, explicit connection to false prophets. You'll read that as Matthew's account is longer on the Sermon of the Mount, he speaks of false prophets, and then you'll read of uh, verse 16 to 20. But when you read Luke, uh, he starts off with judgment of others and how we as hypocrites should not uh, look upon others' motes, but take ourselves first and clean it first. And then he makes the immediate connection to his audience instead of just false prophets. Uh, scholars admit that there is a history of difficulty of understanding the origins of this specific account. But regardless, it gives us a greater reason to understand that these warnings are not just meant for you to examine other men, other people aside from yourselves. Because Luke's account is speaking directly to all believers, and Matthew's account is speaking directly about false prophets, it gives us the great reason to ultimately examine ourselves whether we are truly in the faith. And so I urge you, my hearers this morning, with much fear and trembling, to examine the fruit that you bear in your life. For the fruit you bear is great insight to your true nature. For the day approaches, next Lord's Day, we will learn of this day. But the day is approaching. The day where many will say to him, Lord, Lord, and he will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And so there's urgency for this teaching today. There is a need for the church of God to hear it. For the day of judgment is approaching. And the apostle makes it very clear that when we stand before him on that great day, that we would not be ashamed, but confident that we stood before him in total obedience and faith, in submission to his lordship. Or will we be the disobedient, the false converts, the false prophets who bear false fruit, where he will call us to leave and to depart for we are men of lawlessness. Let us examine verse 16 and 18, please. He says, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. So what you have in verse 18 is the impossibility. What you have in verse 17 is the certainty. And again, verse 16 is the introduction to what we call the impossibility. But I think it's important first to remind ourselves of this term fruit. Last week, we considered scripture collectively. We learned that the term refers to what a man produces, and not necessarily and literally the fruit that he's planting in his backyard, but the very action, the very work of this man that he produces in his life. And this could be translated whether it be in his teaching or his speech or his lifestyle. All of it testify to his nature. And the Lord's point here is very clear to us that as a tree is judged by its fruit, so is a man judged by his lifestyle, his way of life. 
Some have suggested that the grapes and figs here are those Christians who got sucked into the figs and uh, thistles of the false prophets. But I don't think we need to complicate the Lord's statement here. It's as clear as it can get that the Lord is clearly stating an impossibility. He is saying that grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes and figs are not gathered from thistles. Hence the main point in verse 18, a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. For each tree, as per verse 17, will bear the type of fruit which corresponds to its nature. And if there's anyone who knows this the best, it is the Lord Jesus Christ. After all, he is the creator of all things, who designed, who created all plant types accordingly, and knows the very fruit that it will produce. And most certainly, he's not only the creator of all things, but also responsible in giving man a new nature. And so as he knows the very result of each tree, he also knows the very work that he has done in a man, if indeed he has done that work. And so he knows it all. And I think one major point that I would like to make in this sermon is that the false prophet or the false convert may fool us on this earth. And we may try with great judgments and criticism, but we, he, he may fool us on this side of heaven. But the false prophet and the false convert will never fool God. That should strike a great wave of trembling through all of us. If indeed we are in Christ, our fruit is recognized by God. And if we are not of Christ, our pretending, our false fruit is recognized by God. That which is God glorifying, according to this account, can never issue from a false prophet or a false convert as per Luke. And so I think, uh, again, it is important for us to recognize what Scripture speaks of the term fruit. I mean, for the Jews, it was uh, immediately understood that when they spoke of trees and fruit, it was in regards to a man's lifestyle. It was in regards to his obedience to the very law. But what does Scripture talk about when it comes to to speaking of the fruit of a man, which helps us identify the mark of a true Christian. Let's first look here in Luke chapter 3 and look at the points of Scripture to talk about or to point to us the very fruit of one whose nature is settled in Christ Jesus. Luke chapter 3, and you can parallel this to Matthew chapter 3, but I like the extensiveness uh, that is recorded in Luke's account, Luke 3, 7. And the word of God says, He said, therefore, this is referring to John the Baptist, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with Repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. What do we have here? We have a people who have heard the message of John, which is to prepare the way of the coming Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, paving his way. And he marveled at the fact that there were false teachers and false uh, professors of faith before him. Hence he says, you brood of vipers, who warned you to come and repent of your sins? And you see that he describes and recognizes clearly that these men hide themselves behind the privileges of Abraham. That because we are ethnically related to Abraham, we are already and immediately the children of Abraham. 
But in verse 9, he says that the axe is now on the root of the trees. Referring to the word of God, the judgment, the coming Messiah has laid the sword on the root of the tree and it's about to rain its judgment upon all disobedient and the judgment will come where the tree, all of them that are evil and corrupt, will be thrown into the flame. So here we have the fruit of repentance. He says to bear the fruit of repentance. But what is exactly the fruit of repentance? For it's still left off broad here. Well, it's exactly what is mentioned from verse 10 to 14. When these men came, after hearing his statement, bear fruit, they asked, what shall we do? He is saying all of those who find themselves in evil should live a life in total fear of God. For those who have something to share it, to those who steal money, that they would collect no more than what they should collect, and that the soldiers would not extort money from anyone by threatening them or uh, uh, falsely accusing them. And these are ways to prove that one has turned from their sins. It is truly a fruit of repentance if one has turned from the old way of life to a new one. It is no different than what Paul says, that all men in Christ are new creatures. And so here we have an example, the fruit of repentance, that is seen greatly in the lives of all genuine believers. All Christians have this spirit of repentance. They have a disposition that is bankrupt and poor before God. All of them come to the Lord without boast. All of them come to the Lord without anything to exalt themselves or any grounds to exalt themselves on. There are people who are humbled before a holy God. That is the mark of repentance. Not that we just come to be baptized in the waters of John, but that we would be a people who've immediately turned from our sins before him who is holy. And so scripture speaks of a fruit of repentance or fruits of repentance, a new life, a direction of righteousness. Another one is spoken of, of course, clearly in the word, uh, by the words of our Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 15, if you may turn, please. This is quite familiar to all of us. John chapter 15. In verse 7. And you can recognize that John 15 has the same idea of what we just read in Matthew 7. The entire chapter. But here in verse 7, Jesus says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. What fruit do we have here? Well, it's called the fruit of obedience by many, for the reason that in verse 7, he says, If you abide in my words, that is, to bear fruit is to obey, to follow the words of Christ. And in this, we see that there is a multiplication of that fruit purged by the Father himself. And so there's marks of a true Christian. He is a repentant individual, and he is also an obedient individual. This is a mark clearly seen by all who have been changed by the Holy Spirit. He is not perfect, but he has that disposition. Uh, Paul says in Ephesians 5, 8 and 9, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found on all that is good and right and true. That is the fruit of a genuine Christian. And it's already, I bet it's already in your minds, the most extensive account in regards to the fruit of a believer is found in Galatians chapter 5. Let's read that um, together. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Certainly, we can, uh, you have many people who can quote the very fruit of the Spirit. But why it's important to read them again, because our souls fail so greatly to remember the very fruit 
that comes from His Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, and this is now for us to ask ourselves, if indeed we have the Spirit. The fruit of His Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. These are not just in reference to good morals. These are morals that are crucified in Christ, who have rejected and died to the world. This is not just a patient man who has temperaments that are well, patience and goodness and has a great expression of joy. No, this is a man who has these temperaments, but it's embedded because he's crucified with Christ. He died to the world. He died to the passions of this life. And Paul continually adds on to the mark of a believer. He says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. That is the mark of a genuine believer. And, and most of all, let us not lose sight of the Beatitudes of Matthew 5. We've studied that for so long. The Beatitudes of Matthew 5 in our Lord's teachings are their evidences of those dispositions in you is the question. Are there evidences of those dispositions in those who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? We are called to test the Spirit, and so test each pastor, test each minister, test each professing uh, believer uh, or individual, and most importantly, test yourself. Do you see those clear evidences of those dispositions of Matthew 5 in your soul? The Word of God is clear. These are the marks of true believers. Obviously, this is not everything. I mean, you can read the Acts and see the very character of a believer and what believers and their habits were. They dedicated themselves to God's word. They met with God's people. They loved God's people. They proclaimed the truth without compromise. They endured persecution. These are a people who loved Christ till the death. Because Christ truly had added souls to the church. He himself has done that work in every man. And since he has done that work, that same spirit will be evident in every man who's, uh, who is consumed by his spirit. But please, as you recall and sorry, as you consider these very marks and fruit of those who are genuine believers, we must be reminded that the false prophet and the false convert does everything contrary, everything opposite to the genuine convert. Everything we've just read, the false convert does the opposite. They may be in sheep's clothing, hiding behind masks, and they may even appear virtuous for a time. But there's one thing about this teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ that makes this statement very clear. He says that every good tree will bear good fruit and every bad tree will bear bad fruit. They cannot do one or the other. And so it is a true statement that even if the false prophet and the false Christian may appear virtuous for a time, it cannot last forever. For his nature will cry out. His dead spirit within will cry out his depravity. And he will live his unrighteousness before the world. He may appear as an angel before all men, but his wickedness will be exposed. Their nature will always be revealed because it is seen in their teaching, their character, and their conduct. This is how we recognize the false teacher. He may be in the church, she may be in the church, and it may not be recognized until 10 years later. But his wickedness, her wickedness, will always be revealed. 
The Puritans called these men temporary believers. Temporary believers who seemed to come under the influence of the gospel, who gave such an appearance of godliness, who said the right things, but eventually gave clear evidence that they never received Christ from the start. They describe these types of temporary believers to be those who go with the hype, as Hebrews 6 teaches us of the people who join the revival and join the great movements of evangelicalism and, and, and Christianity, where there's a large group of people giving their lives to Christ. And in, the, in their midst, there is a people who perhaps been swayed by the influence may have even participated on, in the Lord's table, in the prayer meetings, in the activities of the church. But sooner or later, these people have been exposed because their depravity cries out, they cannot continually live this way. The man of unrighteousness cannot force his spirit to live righteously before a holy God. He will be found out in his sin. And Calvin said, Nothing is more difficult than to counterfeit virtue. Nothing is more difficult than to pretend. We were talking about a man who lived his life and died, and uh, one asked me, well, how come there are people that live their life as though they were noble, and then when they died, we figured out that they committed such sins before God? And I told them who, well, we spoke about the certain man, and I said, well, when we look at the ministry of a man, what does he teach and what does he not teach? And we were in ref referring to a great apologist, who was recognized as a great apologist, but a man who omitted the teaching of the judgment of God, the gospel of God, Christ and him alone before the people and the millions of people that he stood before. And so his death and the revelation of his sins was not the only mark of his false conversion, but also the omission of truth in his teachings. And so this is very clear. A man cannot pre uh, live in his pretending position forever. His character and his conduct will reveal it. It will be proclaimed in the, his beliefs. It will proclaim itself in his teachings and his speech. Remember Luke 6.45 says that for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's what Jesus says there. And so you'll know a man based upon what he says, whether he's a spiritual man, if he speaks Christ, if he's always reverent of the Lord that he stands before every hour of his life. He will not speak anything that will turn one astray. He will not speak, though he may not be perfect in his speech, but he has fear of God. You'll know him based upon what he speaks. And though he may coat it with smooth speech, smooth as butter and soft like oil, as the psalmist says, but he will eventually be found out as a man of his own gain. Oh, how great then! is the warning of the Lord Jesus Christ. That in the midst of a corrupt generation, that church members, Christians, would have to beware even amongst themselves that they would not be fooled by such uh, pretend or a man who hides behind a facade. And so it proclaims itself. I mean, you're here in Galatians 5 right now. I mean, look at the fruit of the flesh. Though here it speaks of the works of the flesh, this is the fruit of the diseased tree in verse 19 of Galatians 5. What is it? A man may pretend all his years, but he internally is this. The fruit of a man who is diseased, it's evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, those first four are in reference to the abominable works that man does in his body, his lustful habits, his lustful desires. Brethren, if I do not say it now, then I will be accounted in the judgment for not saying it. Many brothers and many sisters come with great appearances before us uh, as we meet, 
but struggle and love and tolerate such immorality, sexual desires, sexual actions with men and women that they are not married with, uh, to. The age of porn, uh, porn, uh, porn and, and, and finding it all over the internet where it's no longer hidden or locked away from children where they can access it. They can watch and live their fantasies in their private rooms. And I'm not speaking of those outside the very gathering. I'm speaking of those inside, those who are plagued with this curse and are also practicing it, yet professing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is an impurity about their nature. It is not of the Lord. And the greatest blasphemy is to profess salvation when internally we know that the spirit that conflicts us is not from God himself, that that could never be from God. It could never be associated with the divine Holy Spirit. What great blasphemy for a man to do, for a man to say he is in the Lord, but to continue in such works of impurity. These are the works of the false prophet, and these are the works of the false convert. But beyond what he does in his body, it also involves what he does in his worship and relationship with God. Verse 20 speaks of idolatry, sorcery, enmity, and relationship with others, um, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions. He is a man from the very root, a divisive man. A man who seeks to divide the sheep of God and join them with those who are the goats. He is a divisive man who will seek to gain an audience for himself, to gain power and fame from his flattery. He wants authority. Verse 21, he is envious, he is a man of drunkenness, orgies, and there the list goes on. And the warning is clear. Those who do such things, which we miss a lot, we must adhere to the final fate of those who practice such things. And he says, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. They are on the broad way, on their way to destruction. Those are the ones who pretend. They may not appear with gross sins immediately, but their nature and the spirit within them crave for such abominable things before the Lord. Another profound text is 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter two. And I want you to recognize something first in verse uh, before sorry, before you turn to chapter two, first in verse one. Uh, sorry, chapter one. <laughs> I'm leading you everywhere. Chapter one, verse four. I Remember, there's always a contrast, two trees, two fruit, light and darkness, fruits of the spirit, works of the flesh. There's always contrast. Peter opens up his contrast in chapter one and look at verse four. He says, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. So he's referring in verse 3, to that divine power that God has granted to all true believers. And all true believers are recognized to be those who participate in the divine nature. You see? Remember Matthew 7 says that based on his fruit, that's what he is, right? That's the nature uh, that is within. And so the same here in 2 Peter 1. All genuine Christians are participants of the divine nature. That's who we are now and what we've become in Christ. 
And these men and women who are a part of the divine nature have escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Now, when you go to 2 Peter chapter 2, and just quickly before we read verse 1, notice in verse 20, Peter is referring to the false prophets. He says, For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and, over, and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. Chapter 1 is referring to true believers with a divine nature or participants of the divine nature. While false prophets of chapter 2 um, are, do not escape the corruption of the world, but rather are entangled by the corruption of the world and are much worse than the state they found themselves in from the beginning. So Christians escape the world. False prophets are entangled by them. Let's read now, please, verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought, the, who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. And you see, these are a, ty a different type of people or a different, this is a different spirit that even angels have not come close to the very vile things that these false prophets have done. But these like irrational animals, brute beasts, Creatures of instinct, uh, instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. That's the false prophet. He has, as the Lord says, a ravenous wolf character. He is a brute beast, born to be caught and destroyed, he blasphemes and speaks about matters which he has no idea of. Suffering wrong in verse 13, as they wage for the wrongdoing, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. There are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Accursed children. False prophet is after your pockets. The false Christian is after his fame. This is the basis of his teaching. Verse 15, he forsakes the right way. He goes astray. He is as one who follows the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These false prophets are waterless springs in verse 17 and mist driven by a storm. They don't have life. They are no different than the words of Jeremiah where God was speaking through the prophet and he was warning them, peace, peace. 
peace when there is no peace to be found. He has no basis of life. He has no life in his teaching. Does not raise conviction. Does not raise Christ. And so he is a waterless spring. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. As much as we hate the thought of false teachers and false converts, that statement should break us apart. These false individuals have a destruction reserved for them, which we plead before the God of mercy to have mercy upon these false teachers and have mercy upon the false disciples. They continue in that route, destruction awaits them. Verse 18, for speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. That is profound. We cannot live as those blind to what we see in our own city, in our own province, in our own nation, and all over the world. We must recognize that there is a lot of false teachers who lead men astray. They promise peace to a people who commit their lives to that congregation. But they themselves who teach behind the pulpit are not free from that corruption. That breaks, and that should break your heart. A few years ago, a young group of young people from a different church came over to my place, and they asked to continue a few things to study with them on the words of God. And I asked, is there any way that you can continue this somewhere where you go? And they said, we just don't hear these things. And what upsets me the most is that after hearing the words proclaimed to them, these young people continued in the way of falsehood. Because that is the direction of every person who has not known Christ, even if they hear the truth. If not in nature change, they will follow the false prophet and his woos. They promise some peace, but they themselves have not escaped corruption. They are slaves as well. Verse 20, for if after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are entangled in them and overcome them. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the unholy or sorry, the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. That is, there and found in 2 Peter 2 is not just the false prophet, but even the product of the false prophet. There are listeners as well who have heard some truth, thought they had truth, thought that they were saved, but returned to their vomit and like I said earlier these may not appear immediately that way and we would be naive to think that that is not a possibility in our church we may appear outwardly well but the false convert has an unspiritual character about him you can't define a Christian based upon his attendance in church or how much he gives, how much uh, they support the minister and his teaching or, or whatever external thing may be practiced. It is defined based upon that inner change. And so he might not be doing gross things as described in Galatians 5, uh, 19, but there's an unspiritual character about him. He's not 
a man who reveres and trembles before Christ on a daily, every hour of his existence, he could care less about Christ. The moment he walks out the doors, his Lord, the lordship of Christ is not uh, in effect when it comes to his soul. It, it doesn't bother him. It only has an effect when he comes under the means of grace. But he, there's an unspiritual character of him, a lack of reverence of God, and, and you could say a lack of that sanctified frame that is evident in every true Christian. He lacks that. And I tell you today, beloved, that these people are the greatest enemies of the Christian faith. They are the greatest enemies of the Christian faith. They are greater than those who militantly persecute us outside of these doors. For these wolves attack us from within, come in unnoticed, unaware. They are the apostates that the scriptures speak of. They are worse than those who harm us in the flesh. They are those who desire to harm our souls. They are the greatest enemies. Dr. Lloyd-Jones says, counterfeit Christianity has always been a hindrance and the greatest enemy of true spirituality. And surely the greatest trouble at this present moment is the worldly state of the church. Mind you, Martin Lloyd-Jones is not living in the same time we are. If the church in his day was in a bad state, you can rest assured that the church in our day is in a much worse state. He says, we should be more concerned about the state of the church herself than about the state of the world outside the church. As many can get so caught up in the politics, can get up caught up with all the movements and these things they want to do in society, and this is not, of course, in reference to evangelism, that is still the will of God, but this is in reference with those who tie themselves to the affairs of the flesh and the world. He says we should be more concerned about the state of the church. The reason is because the present state of Christendom is to be found inside the church and not outside. And so it is our business, it is our duty. Hebrews 10, when the author of Hebrews is calling Christians to prepare for the day is drawing near, he's saying, serve one another. But a part of our service is also to be aware of one another, to protect each other from the harm that comes from these wolves, false teachers and false converts. We must be concerned. And so you are blessed not because of your preacher and not because of any man who is great in, in ex expository preaching or the exegesis of God's word or anything, knowledge he may know. You are blessed beyond measure if you hear the voice of the shepherd. That is a blessing. That in the midst of this difficulty, the voice of the shepherd is calling you out from this world of difficulty, this world of corruption and sin. And so the question is, who will survive? Who will endure? Who will discern? Who will have faith? And Christ makes it clear. His voice shouts aloud and his sheep hear him and they will draw to him and they will come to him. They will follow him into that narrow way, regardless of what may come. And so we are blessed if God's word is heard in your soul. Many have said we are blessed because of, our, of the preacher. We're blessed because he proclaims. But most certainly, Matthew 5 speaks of the true blessedness. It's not about anyone external. It's about what God has done in you. If he has given you that genuine witness of his word in your life, then that is a blessing. that you hear his voice and you tremble at the words of life. Please go back to Matthew 7. Matthew 7, 19, as we close up. 
The Lord says, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. If you uh, remember Matthew, uh, Matthew 3.10 and Luke 3, John the Baptist says the exact same words. The Lord Jesus says the same words, the exact same words of John. And what are these words telling us? that surely the final outpouring of God's wrath awaits these false prophets and converts. That should break each and every one of us. One day they will be thrown into judgment. That final outpour of God's righteous wrath. Malachi 4.1 For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. When all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble, the day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. There will come a day where these prophets and false converts are no more. Their root will be stripped from them. The fruit upon them will be punished. They are reserved for this burning wrath of God. And so pray to the Lord. Pray, number one, that you would be found in the truth. Pray for your church, for your minister, that we would continue in the truth. And pray for all who teach falsehood and all who pretend that God will expose them, that he would expose them. To close our teaching uh, this morning, please uh, read with me Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Verse 36. The word of the Lord Jesus Christ states that then he left the crowds and went into the house and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one and the many who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father, he who has ears Let him hear. Beloved, may God have mercy on us. May he awaken us and grant us the strength, the discernment with regard uh, regard to these individuals who present danger to our souls and misrepresent the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, again, however poor our judgment may be, Concerning ourselves, concerning false teachers, and concerning false Christians, God is never deceived. And we will all find out. Remember next Lord's Day, Matthew 7, 21. Many will come, Lord, Lord. That's why it's important that we hear this message. Are you bearing the right fruit? Are you in John 15, though the Lord was encouraging his disciples there, truly connected to the vine? Because he, the Lord, says so, that those who did not bear fruit in him were cut and thrown into the flame. You must enter that narrow gate alone, and you must examine yourself whether you are in Christ. For in your pretending, the day of judgment will find you out. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Lord, forgive our nation. Forgive us, the churches of all the world. 
forgive this local body. Forgive us, O Lord, for having people behind the pulpits who do not love Christ. Forgive us, for we are in the midst of a generation of men who do not proclaim the whole counsel of God. Lord, you are returning soon. And Lord, you bear witness by your spirit that you are drawing near by your words. And it is greatly evident that this apostate spirit and heart is plaguing the churches. Help us know the fruit of one who is in Christ. We are considered blessed and we thank you and praise you this morning that you have allowed us to hear for many people don't hear. Many people aren't taught this Lord, but you have blessed us to hear. So open our ears then and open our hearts to obey and submit, to bear the fruit of repentance, to bear the fruit of obedience, to bear the fruit of the Spirit, that on the day of judgment, that you would, Lord, help us stand in confidence that we are reserved for glory. But if there's anyone in this room that has been pretending and have not truly received Christ, trouble their conscience until they know you. Thank you for this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand to your feet.